Praise the Lord and welcome to the Bible Heritage Pentecostal Holiness Church. This is Pastor Randy Richardson. Tonight we're going to sing before we get into the Word of God in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 3. We're going to sing a song that says, He's the lily of the valley. Praise God. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my grief has taken and all my sorrow borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken. And all my idols torn from my heart, and now he keeps me by his side. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan takes me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. Hallelujah! He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear, with his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, who were rivers of delight will ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's a prayer of ten thousand to my soul. He's the lily of my valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all.
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He's the lily of my valley, my bright and morning star, and I bless his name. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Be flipping in your Bible over to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter number five. And we're going to start off in verse number three tonight. Verse number three tonight. I've entitled this message, How Does God's People Commit Sexual Immorality, Impurity, or Greed? When you hear those terms, sexual immorality, impurity, or greed. The first thought should never be the church. The church, God's people, should never be found guilty of any of these sins. Ephesians 5.3 in the New Living Translation reads, Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Now that, point to yourself and say, Paul wrote this to me. Paul wrote this to me. Such, such sins have no place in the life of a believer. And yet we know, unfortunately, because we live in this fleshly temple, this human fleshly body, we are subject to sin. We're subject to the temptations, the same temptations that the world is tempted with, we are tempted with. And so it's important that we keep this body in subjection to the Holy Spirit of God, that we stay in the Word of God and we live by the principles of the Word of God. And when the Holy Spirit says, no, stop, quit, don't, you shouldn't, don't go there, don't be in that certain place. You are listening to the voice of the Spirit of the Lord who is trying to keep you clean, to keep your garments white and pure, ready for the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. We have an obligation to the Lord, to our family, to our church, and our church family, to the world, to stay pure and live above sin. Paul is addressing believers, Christians, God's people. He's not writing this letter to the world. He's writing this to God's people. And the church of Ephesus it says he wants them to abstain from these three areas that believers can struggle in. Now let's look at these three in particular, starting off with one, sexual immorality. Everywhere you look, whether it's television, the population, you can't even go to Walmart without seeing people that are scantily dressed. You see people that are not walking in holiness, but they're living their lives as if there is no God, there is no rapture to come, there's no judgment day to stand before, and so they 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 look like the world and they act like the world and God's people are confronted with those images from television, movies, videos, Walmart, the general population, the places you go. And so we're confronted and exposed to sexual immorality. You say, what is sexual immorality? It is illicit sexual intercourse in general. God created sex between a man and a woman under the umbrella of marriage. It is not for single people. It is not a solo act. It is not something that's to be done between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. 
It's definitely not something that children should be involved in or youth should be involved in. We should be teaching our children about abstinence. We should try to keep our children pure at mind and pure at heart and do everything that we can to keep them knowing what the Word says about sexual immorality. Paul was talking to the church about Gentiles that were getting saved and coming in the church and still practicing sexual sin. Acts 15, 20, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from throwing things strangled and from blood. He was basically giving a warning to the church in general to tell the Gentiles, the folks that were getting saved, that they needed to keep themselves pure from the world. Acts 21, 25, but concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Over and over and over in the word of God, God forbids his people to be involved in impure sexual activity. 1 Corinthians six twelve says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of, of any. You say, what are you talking about there? Under the power. Did you know that uh, sexual drive is a powerful, powerful thing to fight against? It's like when you're so thirsty for a glass of water, you've been out mowing the grass and you've been out in the yard working and you're just, you sweat and you sweat and you sweat and your, your body is just craving for water. You haven't had anything to eat for hours and hours and all of a sudden you are just starving to death for anything to eat to satisfy the craving. Well, it's the same thing sexually. We are created as sexual beings and that's why God created marriage to be able to satisfy that craving. Romans 1.29 says, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. He's talking about the things of the flesh, yielding to things that can be more powerful than you are in your own power. You are in a situation and, and someone is making a pass at you. You can yield to that and subside to that or you can say no Satan get away from me that's not uh, what I want to do I want to honor God 1 Corinthians 5 1 says it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife now here is Paul talking about the church of Corinth. Corinth was a city that was overrun with sexual immorality. I won't even begin to describe the architecture, the, the uh, art, everything was centered around sexuality in this commerce city of Corinth. And yet in the church that seemed to have the most spiritual gifts, the gifts of healing and gifts of, of uh, discerning of spirits and on and on, was also in that church a man that was sleeping with his father's wife. And, and Paul was saying, even the Gentiles don't do things like that. And yet y'all haven't even shamed him. Y'all haven't even tried to restore that man. You just act like he's just one of the bunch and, and it's okay to do what he's doing. I've, I've seen churches where husbands and wives swap husbands and swap wives in the church and they stay in the same church. And 
One man was a worship leader in a church here in Georgia, and uh, he he his uh, wife I think played the uh, or, or he ran off with the piano player, and they got married. Well, the piano player's husband ran off with the song leader's wife, and they all got together and said, you know what, we're all more compatible this way, and so they divorced and married, and do you think God would bless something like that? No, God's not going to bless anything like that. I've had people tell me, oh, this person was, was more spiritual, and that's why I left my wife, so I could be with this spiritual lady, and, and then they commit adultery together. And they live in sin and then expect God to bless it. That is not God's plan. That is not the way God ordained marriage to be. He said in 1 Corinthians 6, 13, Foods for the stomach and stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. In other words, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and you should keep your body pure from sexual sin. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee sexual immorality. Flee it. Don't participate in it. Don't yield to it. The other night I wanted ice cream so very bad. I wanted it. Well... I'm trying to get my sugar under control. I've been on two different diabetic medicines. The doctor took me off of one because I've done so well with my diet and I've exercised and I've got my body under control. Well, when they took that pill away, I had to start over again. Now I'm trying to get my body back under the 125 uh, reading on my sugar. And uh, it's not so easy. The other, I realize now that that second diabetic medicine allowed me to cheat just a little bit. And so now I've had to start looking at portions and I've had to start looking at some of the things that I've been eating. And I wanted ice cream so bad. And so I, I was ready to get in my car and go drive down to the Dairy Queen and satisfy my fleshly desire. But I knew that my sugar had been close to 200 that day. And I knew that I, I had to make a decision and I chose to put my flesh in subjection and I denied myself that wonderful blizzard and I got up the next morning and my sugar was like 130 some odd, which is not where I want it, but it's closer to where I want it. So if you deny the flesh, there's blessings that come with that. And uh, God says to flee sexual immorality. When your body is desiring a, 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 another woman, another man, or whatever it's desiring sexually, you put that under subjection to the Spirit of God and you just say, no, devil, I'm not going to yield to that. And you command it to go in Jesus' name. That's why 1 Corinthians 7, 2 says, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Sexual relations should only be for married couples. Some in the Corinthian church refuse to repent over the sin of sexual immorality. And 2 Corinthians 12, 21 says, Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I will mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. Paul was saying, I hope that God will give me the grace to be humble when I confront those people. And you say, you mean you should confront people? yes. That's one of the roles of a pastor. That's why it's good to be a part of a church where the pastor knows who you are and, and operates in the gifts of the Holy Ghost so he can discern if you're involved in anything that's going to keep you out of heaven. And just like a regular shepherd tends to his sheep, a pastor should 
if he knows that you're living in sin, should confront you and say, brother or sister, I, I, I feel in my spirit that you're not doing right and, and in this particular area, I believe you're struggling and I want to help you. I went to a man one time that had fallen to adultery over and over and over. And uh, I went to him and I said, brother, please come to my office and let's sit down and we will get to the root of it and we will command it to go in Jesus' name and we will get we will get you into the victory in this area. But he never took me up on it. He just kept hoping his wife would forgive him. And she would. And they'd have a hard time for a little while. But then she'd cave in and he'd be sweet. And he'd bring her flowers. And he'd bring her candy. And he'd bring her things. And he'd help her out with more of the kids. And just about the time she trusted him, one more time he'd go out and have an affair with another lady. He never took advantage of having a godly pastor. And folks, I'm here to tell you that's one of the roles that I serve. I will confront you if you're a part of this church. If you're involved in sexual immorality, I will come to your house and we will sit down and we'll pray together and we'll talk together. And I won't be pointing my finger at you. I won't be condemning you, but I will come as, as, a, as Paul just said there, as humbly as I can among you. Because God never wants to whip his children into submission. He wants to love you into submission. He wants to show you that there's a better way. And if you yield to the Lord, if you yield to the goodness of God, then God will do awesome things in your life and bless you in ways that you've never experienced. You, my friend, you and I have a responsibility in this area. Colossians 3, 5 says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So God instructs us, put these desires to death. You say, oh, but it feels too good, or I enjoy it too much. Well, do you want that to keep you out of heaven? You need to repent and then put to death. Every time you see it raise its ugly head, and all of a sudden your mind goes to that dark place where you begin to lust, or you begin to think about a, another person besides the wife that God gave, and you say, but I don't have a wife then you need to be hung one. <laughs> you need to be hung a wife if you are not allowed to uh, have sex and yet you're so eat up with it. You need to be married. And that's something you need to pray about and just give it to God. So well, I don't want to be married. Well, then you're going to have to put it to death and just put it to death. That's all I'm going to say about that. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain, abstain, abstain from sexual immorality. God is telling you to put it away from you. Abstain from it. Just like I abstained from the ice cream the other night, you abstain from sexual immorality. The second thing that he told the church that they could fall into, it's impurity. Impurity is in a moral sense the impurity of lustful, luxurious, recklessly extravagant living. You say, well, I live in Georgia, way across, and there's not a whole lot of extravagant here, and there's not a whole lot of uh, uh, luxurious here. Well, let me tell you, the devil can make an ugly woman look good. The devil can make an ugly man look good. The devil can make something look good to you that'll take you out and take you to hell. Romans 1.24 says, Therefore God gave them up also to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Did you know that when you 
uh, are entertaining sex outside of marriage, you are having impure thoughts. If you go down to the mall or you go down to the store or you're shopping at Walmart and you see someone with a short dress or a, a man with mighty muscles or whatever your attraction is, you need to make sure that if you, you might can say, well, they're pretty or they're handsome and then drop it, leave it alone. Don't go any further. Don't let your mind entertain impure thoughts. Romans 1.24 says, Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness. I don't want God to give up and say, I'm just going to turn them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I'm not going to do that. Romans 6.19, he said, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Our flesh is weak. And the only thing that makes this flesh Strong is in the power of his might when we put on the whole armor of God and we take this sword of the spirit which is the word of God and we crucify the flesh in the name of Jesus and come against spirits that would try to get a hold of our minds in an unholy way. Paul had a burden for people who were bound by sin. He wasn't wanting to judge folks. He had a burden for them. 2 Corinthians 12, 21 said, Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you. I don't want, I don't want to have to talk to people about their sexual sin. I don't enjoy embarrassing folks. And I know it's embarrassing to a lot of people. Galatians 5, 19 says the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Do you enjoy dirty movies? Do you enjoy entertaining yourself and watching movies with nudity on it? Do you enjoy watching shows with women that are uh, dressed provocatively? Ephesians 4, 19 says, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness. Did you know that you can give yourself over and get to a place where you're past feeling? In other words, you don't feel conviction. You don't feel convicted for looking at dirty movies. You don't feel guilty for looking at pornography. You don't feel guilty for looking at that man or that woman and entertaining thoughts of having sexual relations with that person. Ephesians 5, 3 says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be named among you as is fitting for saints. God's saying God's people ought to be living above this, and yet I see it so much in churches that I've pastored through the years. I had this 83-year-old woman who had a husband that had been so good to her and faithful to her, and she had been a good wife to him, but he got bedfast and was in the bed for 10 long years, got to the place where he was in a fetal position, and he couldn't even move. He couldn't move. It'd be, it was even difficult to stretch his arms out. He didn't really even know that anybody was in the room. His mind had just gone to Alzheimer's. And I would go to the house and I would visit the dear old man and pray over him and try to comfort her because I knew she was under a lot of stress taking care of this man. Well, we had a young man about 45 years old come into the church and he was a handsome fella, a debonair kind of a guy and sweet man, humble man, and uh, she walked up to him after church one day, and she said, I'd love to have you come over and have lunch with me, and uh, my husband's at home, and, and, and I have a caretaker taking care of him right now, and, and just come to the house and, and have lunch, and so he thought of her like a motherly figure, and so he said, okay, I'll come over. I'd like a home-cooked meal, so he came over, and Next thing I know, after a couple of weeks of him doing that, 
him innocent in his heart, still thinking of her as a mother figure. Next thing I know, I get a phone call. Did you know that brother so-and-so hung himself by accident? The sheet got tied around his neck, and he went over the top of the bar on the side of the bed and couldn't move, so it choked him to death. And I'm thinking that man hadn't moved an inch in years. He didn't move. How in the world could he wrap the sheet around his neck? And how could he get over the side and then hang himself, even by accident? I knew that old girl had killed him. Killed him. And I thought to myself, dear God, how in the world? Well, the funeral went by and the police let it go and they, they just, they didn't say anything. The folks that had been going to the house knew better, but then they thought to themselves, well, maybe we're judging her wrong and, you know, and I tried to give her the benefit of the doubt, but then about a week or so after the funeral, I noticed she showed up to church and her hair was dyed blonde. She had on green and blue eyeshadow, bright monkey tail red lipstick and she looked tried to doll herself up next thing I know the next Sunday comes by and this dear old boy feeling bad for her he agrees to go to her house and she says why don't you go in there and lay down on the bed and take a nap next thing I know he, he called me up he said pastor I, I, I promise you I didn't do anything wrong. I promise you I didn't in, invite this at all. But he says, all of a sudden, as I was taking a nap, she come in there with nothing but a negligee on, her 83 years old. You're never too old to be tempted of the devil. If the right person come along, the devil can paint you a picture and I pray to God that she repented before she died. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. We should never allow our minds to go to those places. The third thing that he says is greed. You say, well, what does greed have to do with impurity and sexual immorality? Greed is a desire to have what you can't have. It's covetousness. It's a desire for things. I had a lady in one of the churches we pastored, in, and she loved things. She went to the store. And they had a sale on irons. She'd buy three irons. She didn't even need the one that she bought, but she bought three of them. And she'd go to the store, and they'd have, uh, you know, clothes on sale. And if she wouldn't buy one, she'd buy three or four. And then uh, it wasn't long. When you go to her house to visit her, all you could do is walk through these little paths that she had created, little paths. Even her bed. She saved about two foot of her bed, and the rest of it was boxes of brand new stuff piled to the ceiling. It was like going into a warehouse of things that needed to be purchased. But she had allowed herself to have a spirit of greed. We're all living in a world where people want things at their fingertips and they worship material prosperity. If you're not living in a, a four-bedroom, three-bath house with a pool in the backyard, then, then you're living below your privileges. No, it might just be you can't afford that. It might be you can only afford a two-bedroom house with one bath. You need to live within your means. Commercials all the time are trying to appeal to people's greed. On Saturday mornings, used to when we were children, 
Every cartoon was about uh, Captain Crunch or uh, the Bunny Rabbit and, and all these other uh, cereals that, man, you had to have the Lucky Charms with the marshmallows in them. You could not be satisfied anymore with regular Lucky Charms and with other cereals because you had to tell Mama or Daddy, when you go to the store, buy me some Lucky Charms with marshmallows. Success is usually measured by the size of a paycheck. And in the Bible, it warns us over and over against greed and the vice of covetousness, which are so close together. Luke 12, 15, he, Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. When you die, there are no U-Hauls behind the hearse. You do not take anything in the coffin with you. you. You leave it all behind. And if you did stuff it in your coffin, it's just going to rot like the rest of you. Luke 12, 15, he said, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Romans 1, 29, Be filled, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, and on and on and on. Greed is associated with all these other sins. You can get filled with your wanter never being satisfied. I know people that have very nice furniture, very nice bedroom suit, they have very nice car. And yet they're never satisfied. They got to want out and get the next latest model. They want more and more and more. And God may not want you to have those things. You say, well, I can afford it. Well, it doesn't, it's not a matter of can you afford it. It's a matter of does God want you to have it. You need to ask the Lord. Lord, is that something I should do? Many times the Lord has said to me, no. And then other times, God has said yes. You have to talk to God, especially about material things. Romans 1, 29, as I just read, says being filled. Have you ever had your mind so possessed with wanting stuff that you couldn't get it off your mind? Greed can fill you up and possess you if you don't stamp it out early when it comes to your mind, Ephesians 4.19, who being past feeling have given themselves over to greediness. You can give yourself over to greediness and get to the place where you don't even feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So we go back to Colossians 3.5 where it talked about putting to death the uh, members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, and so on, it adds to that list covetousness, greed. The fact is no one can lower their guard against greed and covetousness because we're all subject to wanting things. Even Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden because of her greed. She saw the tree that was full of uh, good, uh, uh, saw it was good for food and it was something to be longed for with her eyes and the tree was desirable to look upon so she yielded to the first sin in man's history and that was covetousness. On one occasion in the wilderness, the Israelites showed disgusting greediness when they complained to the Lord that he was they were tired of quail, and, and God sent a, a great number of quail, and, 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 and then they began to um, um, be gluttons. And in Numbers chapter 11, they were severely punished. Later at the Battle of Jericho, it was greed that prompted Achan to steal some silver and gold and an expensive garment from the spoils of the city. Greed calls Gehazi 
Elisha's servant to try to gain financial advantage from the miraculous cure of Naaman and his leprosy. King Ahab was so greedy, he wanted Naboth's, uh, uh, his neighbor's vineyard, and Jezebel, his evil wife, she concocted how to steal that man's uh, vineyard, all because of greed. Judas Iscariot, a member of Jesus' intimate 12 disciples, so full of greed, he held the money bag and, 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 and was betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Greed can get a hold of you. All of these greedy ones were punished because they fell to the snare of greed. What we need to do tonight is examine our heart and say, Lord, is there any sexual impurity in me? Is there any impurity at all in me, immorality? Is there any greed in my heart? And if so, you need to confess it before the Lord and give it to God. And if you need help, that's what we're here for. Call on us and we'll be glad to help you any way we can. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray against the sin of covetousness, greed. We pray against the, uh, the sin of immorality, Lord, impurity. We pray against the sin, Lord, of, of just sexual immorality. We ask you, Father, to deliver us in the mighty name of Jesus, set us free. Show us, Lord, our sin, and then show us how to get the victory. And if we need help, then, Lord, help us to reach out of our comfort zone and to get help from those who love us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. If you need to mail in your tithes and offerings, mail them to 816 Columbus Street. Or you can use our cash app. It's all in the comment section there. And uh, if you need our help, Alicia and I are always available to minister to you. God bless you and have a good rest of your night. We hope to see you in person Sunday in the service. God bless.